There's a high level of conversation back at it with your host, Mecca Kane. Um, today, I have a great guest in the building, my man, um, Devin Alexander. Um, Devin is co-founder of Rolling Leaf, and he's also VP of the Massachusetts Cannabis Association of Delivery. Now, I have him on here to the show today to discuss a lawsuit that's going on in the state of Massachusetts right now, where there was an issue between certain dispensaries were having a problem with the with the rollout of the, the 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 delivery service and the social equity, how social equity re, re, how social equity recipients would have been able to have a three year heads up. So um, I thought I'd like to have a chance to speak to somebody who not only is involved on the political side, but somebody who would actually be affected, being that he does a delivery service, and that's my man Devin. So um, without further ado, man Devin, thank you for being a guest today. Thank you for having me, man. It's been a long time coming. Yeah, definitely has been, man. We were just talking off air, man. I wish I would, last time I was in the bean, I wish I could have caught up with you, man. Maybe we could have did this in person, but you know, things happen for a reason. I think this is probably be the best time to get you on the, on, on the, on the podcast. For sure. So um, b- um, before we get into the, the, the whole lawsuit and everything like that, man, please explain to my audience who you are and exactly what you do. So my name is Devin Alexander. I'm a graduate of the first cohort of the social equity program. I am the CEO of Rolling Relief. Rolling Relief is a prospective marijuana delivery operator and the vice president, like you said, the Massachusetts Cannabis Association for Delivery. I originally started off working at a local dispensary in Quincy called Ermont. I started as a bud tender, then worked my way up to director of community outreach, where I did a lot of community initiatives, fundraisers, community cleanups. And back in September 2019, I hosted an expungement day clinic where we gave individuals the tools and the resources to remove nonviolent cannabis crimes from their record. And I'm just a big fan of equity nationwide. You know, a lot of people all across the country reach out to me from Colorado, from New Jersey, and even California, where they then have, where I think they have the mecca of social equity out in Oakland. They're down, they're really doing it much better than Massachusetts for sure. Yeah. So um, I have you on today because um, as people know, especially I speak about on the show, I am a native Bostonian. I, I'm born and raised in Boston. My mom still live up there, cousins, everything, man. And um, I, I would I wanted to speak more and speak more to influences in the city and speak more about topics that happen in the city. But like I mentioned to my friend Dan Adams at the Globe, I didn't feel comfortable doing that, being that I don't live in the city anymore. So really, it'd be better for me to find people who could help and have those conversations. Coincidentally, a lawsuit started coming up and down my timeline recently (laughs) from Massachusetts and I kept seeing your name in it. So I said, let me see if I can get Devin on to talk about this. So um, the topic of the day is the CDA lawsuit. Um, For those who don't know what that is, please explain to us what the CDA is and what the lawsuit was and where the lawsuit came about. So the CDA stands for Commonwealth Dispensary Association. It is a trade group which makes up 70% 70% of the operators in dispensaries in Massachusetts. So you see like Revolutionary Clinics, uh, Sierra Naturals, uh, the big players, you know. And originally how the delivery was rolled out in Massachusetts was what they now be- refer to as the courier license. So mm-hmm. they had to set up originally, you would have your location, you would have to contract with one of these adult use dispensaries. You would take on all of their product already pre-packaged and everything you didn't sell at the end of the day you would have to give back to that dispensary. So me and my colleagues found that not to be a viable business model. So that was really a huge reason why we formed the association. And we sat down with the cannabis control commissioners and we showed them financial projections and just how that license type was not financially feasible. So through a lot of public comments, public testimony, we got together and we created what is called the marijuana delivery operator license, which will allow delivery licensees to wholesale directly from cannabis cultivators and cannabis product manufacturers. So what's so special about delivery licenses in Massachusetts is they set aside for equity applicants for the first couple of years. Originally, it was two years with the potential for three. We got that increased to three years with the potential for four. So us creating this new license type, which basically cut the dispensaries out of the equation, got them very upset. And so they filed a lawsuit, you know, so that's where the lawsuit came in and saying, oh, this is not, you can't just start making up rules like this. And at the time, there was only three cannabis commissioners on the board. No, there's four. There was McBride, Hoffman, uh, Flanagan, and Title. But Commissioner Title's term was ending, you know, she was a holdover. And so they were trying to say her vote didn't count towards that, among other things. So they were really upset that Massachusetts passed 
some of the most progressive equity policies they've ever established. So that's where we came, you know, and through this, we reached out to um, Can Inclusive, Mary Fryer. They were a real big help getting our story out on a national level. And once Can Inclusive gave us a spotlight, we started to really take off and really took action. And thankfully, um, through public pressure, the CDA dropped the lawsuit. Yeah, and I, I saw that, man. So, so through the pressure, through pressure, CDA definitely did, did really drop the lawsuit. But where are we at here at, at this point? You know, now that they dropped the lawsuit, that's one thing. But you still understand the sentiment is still is is still in the air. Like people, there's still dispensaries, are still owners and managers who are still anti this 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 new rule. Um, where do you feel like we can go from here after the lawsuit, as far as having a not just an equitable space at the table, but having a, a a peaceful, equitable safe at the space at the table where you could actually make your money and not have to worry about, you know, people still having these type, these still type of feelings. Just say, well, all of it comes down to public service announcements, just knowledge and really just explaining to them the equitable practices. Um, in Boston, you know, they have their own Boston Cannabis Board. And so what they do is they have equity applicants and non-equity applicants and they do it on a one-to-one -one ratio. So for every non-equity applicant they approve, they have to approve an equity applicant right after. Um, there's the city of Cambridge where they have priority for equity applicants for the first couple of years. And I'm pretty sure there's another one, uh, Waltham. Waltham also has equity provisions. You know, like this, the municipalities need education. A lot of cities yeah. and towns in Massachusetts are very unaware of the social equity program itself, economic empowerment, and just how Massachusetts wrote it into their law. You know, we're the first state with a statewide social equity program. There's other, like California has equity programs, but they're all by city. So Oakland is different from Sacramento's and it's different from like Los Angeles, but Massachusetts is all the same across the board. So really, it really comes down to education. A lot of things, another thing that the CDA did besides filing these lawsuits was they spread a lot of false rumors to these municipalities. So there's moratoriums in place in Massachusetts for the cities and towns that ban um, cannabis establishments. And so if you have a delivery company, you can't run delivery operations into these cities and towns that have moratoriums. And the CDA was going around telling people all these delivery companies can come in and deliver into your towns, even if you have a moratorium in place, which is absolutely false. Yeah. Yeah, so this is more about the dispensaries not lose want to lose money and they and not want to lose control more than anything. So I'm, I'm glad I'm glad that now we're, we're, we're to the point where we had the lawsuits been dropped. We're, we're now seeing well, and I and I, you've also been able to see at least the dispensaries' names who have stood up against this. I think that was a, a major win in itself. They should not be able to hide behind a, a screen and then still be able to operate in a space where they, it, like you say, you can't, you can't operate in that space and then want to say, well, we still support equity and social equity. You might, you definitely do not. The day after Martin Luther King Jr. Day, yeah. <laughs> wild, like literally they all posted on their social media accounts too. And then literally the next day the lawsuit came out in uh, pub for public knowledge, which it just blows my mind, honestly. <laughs> Well, congratulations on the work, man. That, I mean, again, you, you you took on the burden of a of, of of a lot of people there, and and luckily we we you were able to strike down what could have been a a, a huge holdback for not just social equity, but for you know for drivers like yourself and for people and for companies like yourself. Um, before we leave, talk to us about um, rolling relief, man. Like like, what's it like being out here on the roads and actually being able to go door to door for people? Well, I haven't even started that process yet, honestly, and because really? of that. Yeah, the application. So that's one of the things about this, um, creating a whole new license type. We created a whole new license type, but now we still have to wait for the applications to come out. So the applications haven't even been released yet. So we literally created a new license type from scratch and had to dismantle the largest trade association in the state just to get our foot in the door and the applications haven't been out yet. So we've been <laughs> through a lot before we've even been able to run a business. They said that it would be released in the first quarter of 2021, which is any time between now and March. So we're still waiting on that, you know. And so you're still waiting. So what? what, you, what uh, well, you like you say you got up, up until March, but um, that's a long time. You know what I mean? And I, I hate how politics works. You know what I mean? You're ready to move, like like I'm pretty sure you're ready to move, but there's always still those little loopholes in, in in laws that'll stop you up, that'll stop your whole entire business. Oh my God, yeah, it's such a process in Massachusetts. They don't make it easy on you. You have to have what's called a host community agreement, which is a contract which is five years in length. 
between you and the municipality you're operating in saying that you're going to pay 3% of your annual gross sales. And so there's no oversight of these agreements, so they're ripe for extortion. Um, the mayor of Fall River, a city um, in Massachusetts, he was my age, he was 26, and he was the mayor, and he was extorting these companies. He was like, if you want these agreements, I'm going to need $300,000 in cash and 12 to 15 pounds of smokable flour. Um, the feds caught one. It, they arrested them. It's crazy, like a whole grand up auto lifestyle. So now Shout out the Fall River, man. <laughs> So um, there's my, there, honestly, that's a huge barrier. Yeah. You have to be connected. And some of these towns, they'll put a cap on how many agreements they'll hand out. And these dispensaries, they've had a couple of years head start to go out and get these agreements because, like I said, our applications aren't even out yet. So we are just now getting through that process, getting the host community agreements, doing community outreach meetings getting provisionally licensed, doing facility build-outs, getting architects, inspections. It's just, it's a marathon, you know? You have to have a thick skin in this game. It's not going to happen overnight. So you just have to really know what you want and lay out a path of how you're going to get it. Yeah. Well, Devin, I'm proud of what you're doing up there, man. I wish you nothing but success. Hopefully, in the, hopefully way before March, you realize what you can actually do with your business, man. It's because I, I see success for you. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. No problem. I appreciate your time, man. That's Cash Color Campus, a high level of conversation.